My name is Andrew Cheshire. I'm currently president of the Royal Economic Society. Um, uh, not for long, though, because the forthcoming president will be taking over soon, Peter Neary. Um, before I start, I have to read some safety information. So please bear with me while I tell you that there is no fire alarm practice scheduled for today, so that if you hear the fire alarm bells ringing, you should leave the building immediately, making your way to the nearest fire exit by following the fire signs. Do not take personal belongings with you. Do not use any lifts. Please report to the assembly point and do not re-enter the building until you are advised that it is safe to do so. Thank you. Well, welcome now to the city of Bristol. Um, it's great university and uh, it's tremendous economics department who are hosting this conference of the Royal uh, Economic Society. Uh, this is something of a return home for me. I'm very pleased to be back here at Bristol where I spent 15 extremely happy years as professor of econometrics. Uh, the team here have put on an, an incredible program of uh, keynote addresses, um, uh, plenary, special and contributed sessions and actually the people to thank are of course them and uh, Sarah Smith particularly for putting this program together but actually you because almost all of you are contributing to the conference and presenting papers one way or another in contributed or special sessions so thank you very much for coming. Um, running alongside this conference is the Bristol Festival of Ideas at which the Royal Economic Society is reaching out to the public of Bristol and putting on three sessions, uh, two of which are reruns for the general public of sessions that uh, are taking place, uh, one today and one tomorrow, on post-Brexit economics and on reskilling the UK. And on Wednesday evening, we have um, the, uh, an event in which I, um, uh, something like 40 years after I was a colleague of his at Birmingham University eating more curry than was reasonable in the Maharaja restaurant in Smallbrook Ringway, I will be interviewing Mervyn King on the end of alchemy, uh, money, banking and the global economy. And that's in the Wills building at the top of Park Street, that very tall church-like building. You're very, very welcome to attend that. I think it's at 6 o'clock on Wednesday evening for an hour. So welcome. It's my pleasure also now to welcome Geeta Gopinath. Uh, she will give the Hahn Lecture, named in honour of Frank Hahn, of course. Geeta is the John Zwanstra Professor of International Studies and Economics at Harvard University. She is a managing editor of the Review of Economic Studies. She has made groundbreaking contributions in international finance and to macroeconomics and has won numerous prizes. She's particularly well known for her work on business cycles in emerging uh, markets and her work on sovereign default. Gita, thank you very much for coming today. She will talk for 55 minutes or so and then there will be time for questions, so please take some notes on the way through and get ready with your questions. Gita talks today on the topic, dominant currency paradigm. Thank you very much. Thank you. The floor is yours. So thank you. Thanks, uh, Andrew, for the introduction and for Sarah for putting the program together. It's a real honor to be here and to give uh, the Han lecture. Uh, in preparing for this, uh, I thought the best kind of lecture to give would be one which uh, covers a bunch of papers that I've worked on over the last several years to kind of bring together some ideas that uh, I think kind of change the way we think about Keynesian uh, macro. So this work is kind of, this, these lectures are built on, um, on work that I've done with many co-authors and I cite them along the way. Uh, uh, but feel free, you know, in the middle of my lecture, if you have any questions, please feel free to, to ask me, uh, to stop and ask at any point in time. Okay, so where do I want you to, uh, to start your thinking? Uh, so this is going to be in the space of Keynesian macro, specifically Keynesian open economy macro. Uh, and here I am thinking about the world where we think of 
the existence of some kind of nominal rigidity in price setting. So that's usually a fundamental assumption in these models. When you go to the open economy context, you have to be a little more specific because you have to be specific about what currency the prices are rigid in. Right? It's not enough to say that prices are rigid. You have to be, you know, have to be a little more precise. You have to say, are prices rigid in the producer's currency? Is it in the destination currency? Is it in a third currency? All right. Uh, and this is a big part of, uh, of, of many discussions that have taken place over many, many de decades, going back to Keynes and Friedman, and even before that, about how do nominal exchange rate fluctuations impact international trade? How does monetary policy in one country spill over to the other country through the nominal exchange rate? Is it important to have fixed exchange rates or floating exchange rates? I mean, these are like perennial debates in, in international macro that, that cover you know, centuries and, uh, and remain to today, including the, you know, the most recent discussion in Iceland about whether they should be pegging and if they should be pegging, to which currency should they be pegging? So I'm going to define what I call the first generation view of open economy macro, which I would define as a consensus view, because that's kind of what you commonly read of in, you know, in, in newspapers and when policymakers speak about exchange rates. This is what they, where they come from. Uh, and that consensus view goes back to uh, the classic papers of Fleming and Mandel, then built on by Dornbush, then more recently kind of mo uh, modern treatments of it by Svensson and Van Weinbergen uh, and Officer Walter Rogoff. Uh, and the assumption there uh, is that prices are rigid in the, in the currency of the country producing the good, right? So if we think of the US and, ja and Japan and we think of trade between the US and Japan, the assumption is that when the US sells to Japan, it sets price in dollars, and the dollar price is sticky for some period of time. Uh, and when Japan sells to the US, uh, the price is sticky in yen uh, for some period of time. Uh, and so in that particular world, and that's true for any pair. So if you look at trade between Brazil and Japan, it would be the case that when Brazil sells to Japan, the prices are sticky in real. When uh, Japan sells to uh, Brazil, it's sticky in yen. In that world, we have a very precise prediction of what happens when you have exchange rate depreciation. So let's think of the extreme case when prices are completely rigid for some period of time. And suppose that you have some events, either driven by monetary policy or commodity price movements or something that move your exchange rate around. So suppose that your exchange rate depreciates, then that's associated with a depreciation of your terms of trade, which means that it makes your exports relatively uh, cheaper in international markets relative to your imports, right? So that's kind of the underlying principle on which countries uh, you know, complain about currency wars, the fact that if a country is viewed as, man as manipulating its exchange rate, making its exchange rate weaker, the idea is that that's uh, basically a country trying to gain competitiveness at the expense of the other country. Uh, and because that gives rise to expenditure switching, because if a country's currency depreciates in this particular world, it makes your good relatively more uh, cheaper in world markets is going to generate a shift in demand towards your products uh, away from the rest of the world, and it's also going to shift your own country's demand away from the rest of the world towards domestic goods. And so you're going to get the classic expenditure switching phenomenon, which should be good for you in terms of your trade balance. Assuming your demand is sufficiently elastic, your trade balance should improve. So this is kind of, again, the basic assumption that underlines Friedman's 1953 conclusion that countries should have flexible exchange rates. Because the assumption is that in a world of sticky prices, of the kind that we're thinking about, which is producer currency pricing stickiness, in that world, having a floating exchange rate helps you correct that friction, which is that suppose that a country's productivity goes up, relative productivity increases, its relative prices should fall, with price stickiness, that adjustment doesn't happen automatically. But if you have an exchange rate depreciation, you can engineer that exact same relative price movement and bring you back to the efficient level of output. Right? So this is 
the, the most, I would say, the consensus view in the sense that it doesn't matter if you're a central banker in the developed world or you're a central banker in the emerging markets, you would come up with the same set of conclusions when you see your currency weakening. You say, well, okay, that might, that's good for my exports, but on the other hand, it could be inflationary. It's kind of bad for my imports in terms, because it makes my imports more expensive. So, and if I continue to buy those, this is going to raise inflation. And it doesn't matter whether you're an emerging market central banker or developed, you kind of have this exact same perspective of, of international trade and exchange rates. The second generation view uh, in Keynesian macro uh, is a view that said, well, but if I look at prices around the world, and if I look at prices in international, in, especially in stores, I don't really see them moving that much with the exchange rate. Uh, if anything, I see failures of the law of one price everywhere. It seems like the prices don't exactly, uh, aren't exactly identical, which would be the case when you have producer currency pricing. Right? You don't see that. Uh, and so Betts and Devereaux and then Devereaux and Engel kind of came up with the second par paradigm, which was what they call local currency pricing, which is that if I look at trade between Japan and Brazil, when Japan sends to Brazil, it sets a price in real, and it's the real price that doesn't change. And when Brazil sells to Japan, it sets a price in yen, and it's the yen price that doesn't change, which means that when the Brazilian real Japanese yen exchange rate moves around, uh, you have that the terms of trade moves in completely the opposite direction, which is that an exchange rate depreciation actually appreciates a country's terms of trade. So the way to think about it is that when Brazil sells to uh, Japan, its prices are set in yen which means that when its currency depreciates, the real price of that particular product has gone up, right? While the goods that it imports are sticky in real, and that hasn't changed. So you have a terms of trade appreciation. You actually, the prices of your products in international markets are now higher relative to the price of goods that you import. But you have no expenditure switching in this world because prices are all sticky in the local currency. If prices aren't changing for the final buyers, then there's, no going, to be, there's going to be no effect on uh, the uh, demand for your particular products. So you have the other extreme case of the Mandel Fleming paradigm, which is the fact that you have absolutely no expenditure switching over here. Uh, both of these paradigms, the producer currency and the lo local currency paradigm, have symmetry underlying their basic structure which is, again, the fact that either everybody in the world is doing local currency pricing or everybody in the world is doing producer currency pricing, right? Uh, which means that all, ex all bilateral exchange rates are as important, as important as your share in world trade. Um, and again, there's a lot of symmetry in how we think about how countries get impacted by exchange rates. In terms of the impact on the policy space, I'd say the local currency pricing paradigm is a, a little you know, less central than the Mandel Fleming. I think the Mandel Fleming is still viewed as the main uh, idea. It is still viewed as a case that when your exchange rate depreciates, your terms of trade depreciates. That's kind of the consensus view. So the local currency paradigm isn't that much. But in international Keynesian macro, I would say, has spent most of its time studying these two paradigms, these, these particular two descriptions of how prices get set in international markets. You know, if you look at it in terms of optimal policy, monetary policy, optimal exchange rate policy, it's all about this particular uh, set of assumptions. So the question is, uh, what do we know about the world uh, in international prices? Now, we've had a lot of very detailed research looking at international pricing in, uh, you know, by different countries uh, at very detailed, very granular level. Uh, that make you question the centrality of these paradigms, right? So what I'm going to do, and this is based on a bunch of my research that goes back about 10 years now, where uh, I'm going to talk about international pricing facts and why is it that, you know, if we had to approximate the world, these two paradigms would be probably the worst approximations that you can think of in terms of defining how prices get set in international markets. Now, we underst I understand that you know, when we write our models, we like simplification, and we want to assume symmetry because that can simplify things. But this, that would be a big mistake in terms of matching, uh, matching reality. And then the next step, I will tell you about how that then changes the Keynesian macro model to incorporate the international pricing facts. Uh, and then 
end with a discussion of both the positive and normative implications of this different view of pricing in international markets. Okay, so, so that's the roadmap, and I'm going to start first with international pricing facts. Okay, so the first thing. If you look at what actual currency gets used in international trade, by far, the, uh, there are very few currencies, firstly, that get used, and the dollar is dominant. Okay, so here is a picture here from my paper that I did for the Jackson Hole Symposium. What we did was we collected data on uh, invoicing shares for invoicing of cur currency invoicing for about half of world imports and exports. Uh, and what these bars basically show you is the left bar, for instance, tells you uh, the, 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 the kind of the solid black uh, horizontal bar over here is basically the US's share in world imports. So the numerator would have US imports over world imports. The same thing for the euro area would be for the grayish, kind of light gray. And then for the darker gray is the rest of the world. All right? And then we have data here for invoicing, and it says, the black portion here says, what fraction of world imports are invoiced in dollars? And that's what that is. And the similar for the euro area, and the remainder is for other currencies. OK, so how much, is, how much, how much of the world imports are invoiced in euros, and how much of the world imports are invoiced in everything else, not dollar, not euro, is the, is the, time, is, is the shorter segment over there. So what you see here, firstly, is that the dollar invoicing share is about 4.7 times its share in world imports. And you can do the same thing here for world exports. The US share in world exports relative to its share as an invoicing currency in world exports. And it's about 3.1 times its share in world exports. The euro has an important presence, but that's mainly because of its trade with other countries that use the euro. Right? So if I look at euro invoicing share, it's about 1.2 times its share for imports and exports. So the euro does get used, but it gets used mostly when you have a euro using country on one side of the trade deal, either on the import side or the export side. All right? It's the dollar that gets used a lot in trade, where it's on neither side of the transaction. So when Japan trades with Brazil, uh, it uses, they use the, both of them use the dollar, though it's neither currency. It's neither the currency of Japan, neither the currency of the, of the, of the Brazilian real. So we see that. Now, the fact that the dollar gets used in international trade was, is not something you know, new that, I, that I'm, I'm making a case for, but this goes back a long time, and I'm just I'm citing McKinnon, who talked about it. Um, more, more recent work by Goldberg and Till and by others. But I think... While there was a statement at that point that said that, you know, if I look at foreign transactions, I see a lot of dollar being used, uh, that doesn't mean the same thing as what we want for our Keynesian assumptions, which is that we want not just that the dollar gets used as an invoicing currency, but somehow that the dollar price is actually sticky uh, relative to the exchange rate, right? That's the part that we would need. Because if you have the dollar, so if I think of kind of commodity prices, sure, the dollar gets used for commodities, but that price is moving around all the time. And that's not a matter for us to, you know, that, that doesn't really generate any interesting relative price movements of the kind that we think about in these Keynesian models. So it's not good enough to say that we just, we know that the world invoices in dollars, but we kind of want to establish the fact that you actually do get stickiness in, uh, in dollar pricing. So that's kind of, I think that's the place where the most recent research, including my work, goes into, which is establishing the fact. So before I go there, let me just point to a slide here again, which is the dominance of dollar invoicing in world trade. This is looking at exports only. And this is just giving the details for it. So for instance, this is Argentina. 97% uses the dollar, 2% euro. Its share of exports to the US is 8%. To the euro area is 14%. I mean, take Japan, J Japanese exports, its dollar share is 50%, despite the fact that its trade with the US is only 20, 22, its, its exports to the US make up 22% of its total exports. Uh, the euro share is 17%, it does use some of the euro. Its own current, 
sorry, I'm looking at the wrong line, is 8% and, and it uses its own currency. If you go to uh, a lot of Asian, East Asian economies, Thailand, uh, you find that South Korea, South Korea, you find that the dollar gets used a lot, while its trade shares with the US are not that big, it's 6%. Um, the UK has about 30% of its exports in dollar terms relative to its export share, US export share, which is 0.14%. .14%. So what you see here is that the, the US is quite exceptional in the fact that 97% of its exports are invoiced in its own currency. This is, comes closest to the Mandel Fleming paradigm, which is that it uses its own currency to sell goods. But you could do this exact same table for import and you would again find that the US does 93% of US imports are invoiced in dollars. So basically in all of its trade by the, on the input side or on the export side, it's entirely dollar pricing. Uh, and there are very few countries, in fact the dollar share for pretty much everybody on the import side goes up by more. Um, and again, what you see here is that the producer currency pricing assumption just fails the test. It's not the case that you're using most, most countries are not using the, their own currencies. And given the fact that emerging market share in world trade has grown so much over the last decade, this has become even more of a phenomenon because most of the, all of those countries do not use their own currency in trading with, 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 with others. Okay, so to the question of what do we see in terms of price stickiness. So, so here, what, it's not easy to do that because we don't, it's not very easy to observe price series. You get unit value data, but you don't get prices. So this work that I have with Rigabone and uh, Oleg, it's okay, uh, we, we looked at data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics for the US because they actually survey firms and get prices, get, you actually get to see the price at which they're buying a very, very, very specific product. So you can actually do like the perfect experiment which is look at how flat do prices stay, when do they change and all of that. So we found that the typical duration for imports and exports were between 10 to 12 months of stickiness. That's kind of how much, what was the typical duration of it. The second thing we found, which was more, even more puzzling to us, was that we observed moments in the data when prices actually changed, right? When the import, uh, the good prices of the good being imported into the US changes, the prices of goods being exported out of the US changes. So we actually observed those price changes. And we could ask, well, when you do change, how much do you respond to the exchange rate change since the last time you changed prices? All right. And what we found was that prices are sticky, you know, are truly absolutely sticky for about 10 to 12 months. But then even conditional on a price change, they don't seem, the, in, the price in its invoicing currency doesn't seem to be that responsive to the exchange rate. So what's the implication of that? The implication of that is that if I ran a pass-through regression, so if I looked at price goods coming into the US and I divided them up into goods that are priced in dollars and goods that are priced not in dollars, it's a small sample but it's still enough number of observations, then can I, do I see a difference in their pass-throughs at various horizons? So what you see here, what I've graphed over here is the pass-through into goods that are priced in dollars is very, very low, uh, one month after the, after the exchange rate shock. Uh, and then if I look at the cumulative pass through 24 months out, which is two years out, it's, you know, it's about 15%. Um, if on the other hand, if I look at goods coming into the US that are priced in a foreign currency, then when the exchange rate moves relative to that other country, the immediate impact is 100%, which is what you would expect. But then after 24 months, you don't really see any convergence in these numbers over here, right? So in the very short run, you would expect the goods that are priced in dollars to not move, and to be sticky, and so you should expect the password to be very low, and you should expect the goods that are priced in a foreign currency, say coming from Germany in euros, if the euro price hasn't changed, then you should expect that the pass-through into dollars should be very high. This is kind of what we would expect to see in a, in a sticky price model. But then we'd expect, if these products are identical, we would then expect to see convergence, which we do not see, right? So we see that even conditional on a price change, the pass-through from prices of pass-through into dollars of goods priced in uh, dollars is about 26%, while goods priced in, say, euros is about 85%, right? 
right? So you see this big difference, and this is looking at goods coming from Germany into the US, from Switzerland into the US, from all of these countries in different various cuts of the data. So this kind of tells you that it's not just that the prices are rigid, rigid, but even when they are changing, they don't seem to be sensitive to the currency. That is, they're relatively sticky in their invoice and currency. Which then tells you that, you know, to assume that these are all the same kind of goods is obviously a bad assumption. And secondly, the fact that there is obviously a decision going into what you want to invoice your product in, and that invoicing decision is affecting what we see in the numbers on pass through. Okay. So, so this was from the perspective of the US. From the perspective of the US, you can get, like I said, you can get very good data. So this you know, tells you, if I look at just trade with the US, both on imports and exports, almost entirely dollar pricing. And the dollar price doesn't seem to be sticky. But then even when it changes, it doesn't change that much relative to the exchange rate, which is why pass through into the US is, in terms of prices is quite low. Okay. But then we could ask ourselves, well, Okay, that's true about the US, but you know, maybe when Germany when sells to uh, Brazil, or when Japan sells to Brazil, or when Japan sells to Korea, maybe they use the dollar, but maybe the pass-throughs are very different. Right? Maybe this is because this is just special, because this is the US. Maybe they do something else when they sell to them. Maybe they, they move around their dollar price a lot. Maybe because you think of Argentina. Argentina, everything Argentina imports is, is imported in dollars. They go through major crises. Do we think that the dollar price stays the same, or maybe it changes, right? So that, when we go to that space, it's, it's harder, because we don't get price-price data. So you have to do something more using some kind of more indirect inference based on uh, using kind of aggregate import and export price index data. So here's a simple uh, you know, a lens through which you want to think of testing these different paradigms in the world. So if you have producer currency pricing, uh, and if I'm looking at goods entering country J from country I, and that's the percentage change of the prices of those goods entering country J from country I in country J's currency. This is the thing about international. You have to like say it in six different ways. The, the, the different, you, know, you have to be very clear about the currency and all of that. Um, so if I look at that, so if I look at, again, let's do uh, Japan and Brazil. Goods coming into Brazil from Japan in Brazilian real, the percentage change in that in the world when you have complete stickiness a la producer currency pricing, which means that the prices coming from Japan are sticky in yen, you're going to find that that puts a weight of one on the bilateral exchange rate. Right? Because why? Because the real price is going to move. If the yen price hasn't changed, the real price is going to move one to one with the real uh, Japanese yen exchange rate. So the, the exchange rate is defined as real per, per yen. And if I put in a, uh, along that, if I put in the, the real dollar exchange rate in there, that regression would put a weight of zero on that. Right? It, would be, it, would, it would be irrelevant for the, for the pass through. And so similarly, if I look at the terms of trade between uh, Brazil and Japan, it would have a weight of one times the bilateral exchange rate for the reason that I mentioned before. Right? The exchange rate moves around, and so you get that the, uh, the price of your imports or the price of your exports, the price of the exports are sticking in real, the price of the imports in real are moving one-to-one -one with the exchange rate, which means that the ratio is moving one-to-one -one with the exchange rate. So that would be a testable implication for third country bilateral trade. If you're in the world of local currency pricing, again, Japan and Brazil, goods coming into uh, Brazil in real, uh, the percentage change in that would put a weight of zero on the bilateral exchange rate and a weight of zero on the, on the dollar. But because basically the local currency price is fixed, it's in real, it isn't changing, so there's going to be nothing that it's responding to. Which means that the terms of trade has a coefficient of a negative one. Again, the price of imports in local currency haven't changed. Price of exports in local currency is going up. Why? Because it's the exchange rate times the destination price at which you, which is sticky. Okay. And then the third is the dominant currency, where B Japan and Brazil are selling to each other in dollar terms. All right. Uh, again, the prices in real of goods coming from Japan in that world would put a weight of zero on the bilateral exchange rate when prices are completely sticky in dollar terms and put a weight of one on the bilateral exchange rate between the Brazilian real and the dollar. Right? 
And in terms of trade, if everything Brazil is importing is sticky in dollars and everything Brazil is exporting is sticky in dollars, the ratio of those two dollar prices are not going to move around. Move around, which means that they're going to put a weight of zero on the exchange rate. Okay? So that would be a set of testable implications. Obviously, the world is not one with complete sticky prices, so you have to think about you know, what horizon are we looking at and, and how much do we see. But given what I just showed you about uh, the US, which is that even conditional on a price change, the invoice and currency price isn't moving around that much, you end up with, uh, you should expect that not to change. But let me just go into that because there's some, you know, it will give you, keep this in mind, this is going to be a testable implication. I'm going to show you some data for it. But I'm just going to go to the next slide first to think about optimal invoice and currency choice. Okay. So again, work that I have with the Choki and Rigobon and a previous, there's an Engel paper, which is that you, when you come, it, uh, should we be surprised to see that even conditional on a price change, the invoice and currency change is not that much, right? And the answer would be no in a world where you do optimal uh, currency choice, right? Why is that? So think of the case of, uh, 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 say, think of case of a case of uh, the easiest case would be to think of say Japan selling to the U.S. Right? Um, the Japanese uh, firm needs to understand that for some period of time it's going to have this contract with the U.S. firm, uh, and the prices are not going to change for some period of time. So the question is, what does it want to keep the price sticky in? Does it want to keep a sticky price in yen, and does it want to keep a sticky price in in dollars? All right. What it's going to think about is that what would best mimic what it could, would do if it could change prices flexibly at every instant in time. Right? That's what it would like to mimic. It would like to come as close as possible to the pass through it would have if it could change prices all the time. So if this Japanese firm selling to the US market is selling a very unique product whose elasticity is not very variable, then it would desire a very high pass-through, even in the, world, in the case where it could change prices at every instant in time. How can you mimic that? You can mimic that by keeping your prices sticky in yen. Why? Because if you keep your prices sticky in yen, you're going to have the same 100% pass-through at every point in time. But on the other hand, think of a Japanese firm selling to the US market that's competing a lot with US firms and competing a lot with other firms selling to the US market. In that case, it's not going to want to pass through a lot. Why? Because if its exchange rate moves around and the exchange rate is idiosyncratic, by keeping its prices ticking in yen, it's going to cause its price relative to its competitor's price to move around a lot. That's going to le lead it to lose market share, and that's not going to be optimal for its profits. And so it wants to keep its price relatively stable in dollar terms. And so that's exactly why then they would go and then price in, keep a price that's sticky in dollar terms. So because of these reasons, you should not see such a big disconnect between short-run pass-through and pass-through conditional on a price change because you're actually trying to mimic that, the, the, the two. Uh, so what are the two kind of micro foundations for why you might want to you know, not let your prices change too much? Why would you end up, or think of a world why you might end up with dollar pricing? The two explanations would be one, I mean, I don't, I don't believe that this is the full set of it, but I'm going to give you two reasons. One is your strategic complementarities in pricing, which means that if you're, if you're selling in a world where everybody else is pricing in dollars, then you'd like to keep your price relatively stable relative to your competitors' prices, in which case it would help to price also in dollars. That would be one reason. The second is that most exporting firms are also importers, which means that in their costs of production, they have dollar costs. Uh, and if those dollar costs are sticky, then they would also like to keep their prices relatively sticky in dollar terms. Right? So both of those would be reasons why you would move to endogenously invoicing in dollars, and that would give you a reason why in a world where everybody is invoicing in dollars, which means your imported inputs are there now coming in dollars, and you're competing with other firms who are invoicing in dollars, you would end up with an equilibrium of this kind. This is obviously, the, the dollar equilibrium is not unique. It could be in a different currency, but all this is saying is that you would end up with coalescing on a particular currency. OK, so this would tell you why even conditional on a change, you might see not see much of a difference. All right, so let me get to the, uh, let me get to the, 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 again, now coming back to the data and remind you of these, these implications over here. Um, so what we did 
was that you know, we want to, ideally we'd obviously like to have all the universe of microdata with actual prices and not unit values. I mean, that doesn't exist. So what we did was we said, okay, let's go and construct um, import and export price indices at the bilateral pair uh, for countries in the world. Now, many countries in the world report aggregate import and export price indices. There are you know, issues with the fact that these might not all be comparable. Secondly, we wanted to leave out commodity prices. We do not want commodity prices in there because all of this stuff has nothing to do with flexible prices but with sticky prices. So we wanted to take out commodity prices. So what we decided to do was let's construct this ground up using Comtrade data at the bilateral country pair level. Uh, and because we do it all using a harmonized system, we know we're exactly treating all the data in the exact same way for all of these different countries as opposed to getting from different statistical agencies whom we don't really know how they construct different things. So we build this up. Uh, and then we looked at, uh, uh, ex we, so then we had bilateral pairs, so we had about 2,500 dyads. We have about 55 countries, uh, so we have about 2,500 country pairs. Um, and we ran a pass-through regression. If you, this is based on a recent pa paper that I have with Emilia Bose and Plagbo Mola. Uh, you should look at the details of what exactly is it that we run in the paper. But let me give you what the headline is. So just look at this left picture top uh, box over here. This is looking, it's exactly this. It's running this, what would look like trying to capture this regression, regressing that on only the bilateral exchange rate. So if I regress this on only the bilateral exchange rate, I'm getting a pass through that is quite high. So this is annual data, by the way. This is annual, so this is years. We're getting a cumulative pass through that's pretty close, pretty high up there, all right? But then what we do, and this is what standard regressions do. So countries, either when they're looking at an impact on their inflation, uh, they are on import pass through, they are regressing it on bilateral exchange rates if they have bilateral data or the aggregate equivalent of that, which is a trade-weighted exchange rate. That's what they would run. And, they, and you would estimate that on average for pretty much most, for the average country in the bilateral pair in the world, the pass-through is very high. But then you run the same regression, but you just take out, uh, put, you just put in the exchange rate of the recipient country relative to the dollar in there, and it completely knocks out the bilateral exchange rate coefficient, right? So the red line is the pass through from the dollar's exchange rate. And remember, this is for, for, I mean, for pairs where the dollar is on either side of the transaction by construction, because otherwise I couldn't have both those controls in there, right? So I have the, this is for, for pairs where the dollar is, is, again, the US is not on either side of the, of the trade deal. The pass-through from the dollar is very high. The pass-through from the bilateral exchange rate is just very low. Right? Uh, if you look at the imported reported, again, you get the same thing. This is what people report, like this is what the typical construction would be. You would estimate a pass-through, and you would say that the pass-through is very high from the bilateral exchange rate, which suggests that somehow the bilateral exchange rate really matters, which is why you care about the trade-weighted exchange rate. But again, once you put in the dollar, it completely knocks out the bilateral exchange rate and gives you that. So this is, this, if you look at this picture here, for instance, you can it come back to our testable implication. It says that the world is here. When you have both controls in there, you're getting very close to putting all the weight on the dollar, very far from the world where you're putting a lot of weight on the, on the, on the producer currency and the, or the world where there's absolutely nothing happening. Okay? So you see that, and that's, uh, you know, it's a confirmation that this is true globally. Um, and we also show this that the dollar importance rises with invoicing share. So if I compare three countries, Switzerland, whose dollar share is the smallest, 13%, Turkey, more intermediate, 60%, uh, Argentina, whose dollar share is 0.88%, you see that again, the dollar share, first of all, the dollar again knocks out the other currency, but it does so more for countries that rely more on dollar invoicing, right? This comes very close to kind of the assumptions we have and the models we write, and this is the prediction we would, we would, uh, we would expect. Um, secondly, we also show that if you look at price pass-through from U.S. monetary shocks, again, you get that these price pass-through from U.S. monetary shocks can be very high. So again, for trade that where the dollar is on either side of the transaction, the U.S. is on either side of the transaction, 
movements in the dollar exchange rate that are being driven by US monetary policy have an impact on uh, bilateral uh, trade, third country bilateral trade. And these effects are quite strong. All right. That's true for quantities, too. You can see that the impact on quantities, so this is not just a price fact. This is also a volume fact. Quantities, quantity imports fall when your, currencies, uh, when your currency depreciates, but the amount that it falls by is mostly driven by the dollar. You see, all of this is being absorbed now by the dollar exchange rate. Again, over here, it's all being driven, absorbed by the dollar exchange rate. So even on the quantity side, if I want to understand the volumes and the prices, the dollar exchange rate seems to be the bigger currency, the main currency to care about, rather than bilateral exchange rates. Which means that if you're running, you just really only care about the trade-weighted exchange rate. You care more about like an invoicing currency share-based uh, based exchange rate. OK. So for those of you who care about whether the dollar versus the euro, I could do the same thing and this with not just the dollar, but the euro in there, but the dollar really wins. I mean, this is the euro's impact. Uh, relative to the dollar's impact. It's even lower than the bilateral exchange rate. So it doesn't, it doesn't show up much in, 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 in world trade. It would show up for a few countries, but if, it, if I was trying to look, describe the world on average, it would not show up. OK, then the other implication was for the terms of trade. The terms of trade is uncorrelated. So again, if I run these bilateral pairs and look at the terms of trade sensitivity to exchange rate, it's basically 0. Right? Again, consistent with the prediction, the simple prediction, which is that this would be the only case in which you would have a terms of trade movement that, would not, that was insensitive to the exchange rate. All right. Um, so, that's, so those were the, the facts. And now, so I'm going to now go on to, given these facts, well, Keynesian macro certainly deserves a redux, uh, given that it's so far from the mandel Fleming paradigm that we all care about. Um, which is, so this is now, I'm going to, this is not going to be related to a paper that I have, uh, another p paper that I have, which focuses from the small open economy perspective, from like an emerging market perspective. The canonical small open economy model in the literature is a paper by Gali and Monticelli, which is, does produce a currency pricing. That's kind of what people use all the time. It's what you use. Um, so, one of the, so one of the countries that I've worked with very closely, whose data I've used a lot, is Colombia. And Colombia, for instance, in its model simulations when it's in the central bank, when it's trying to figure out what's going to happen, it uses a model, this particular model would produce a currency pricing. The, there's a very tiny literature on dollar pricing. Uh, and those are the papers that are listed over there. Uh, but those, instead of, being, instead of those papers being very central to the literature, they've really been quite on the, on the periphery. Uh, and they haven't, you know, because of that, the, you know, the, they haven't gotten the modern treatment that all these other papers get. These are mostly, mostly static, one period ahead price stickiness, which means you can't really ask the kinds of questions that uh, modern Keynesian macro asks about the inflation output gap trade-offs and all of that, because there's no cost of inflation in this world. So that's kind of what we wanted to do. We wanted to say, well, you know, it seems bizarre, given the facts we know about the world, that we're still playing with a model that gets it so wrong on a lot of these facts. And so what we call the dominant currency paradigm is a, is going to, is a model where we have dominant currency pricing, which in most country cases is the dollar, but for some countries can be the euro. We have strategic complementarities in pricing, and we have imported input use. So I bring in the second two pieces because those are accurate descriptions of what happens in the world. And again, it helps you explain the fact that why is that even conditional on change, the invoicing currency price doesn't change that much. Otherwise, it would be hard to get it. So I'm not, do I have another 10 minutes on? Oh, yeah, you have 15 minutes. OK, good. Um, so what we do is then we, using, we use this model. We nest and empirically evaluate the various paradigms. I'm not going to get into the empirical evaluation of it, but let me just tell you what the pieces of that particular model are. Uh, so what, so it's, first of all, it's very important. 99% of the models will have two countries in there. So either you would have a continuum of small open economies where everybody's symmetric, or you would have two large countries and you would do producer currency pricing or local currency pricing. That's symmetry is, a, is an important part of the assumption of the models. Here, it's very important to have more than two countries because otherwise you don't appreciate the, the third currency, currency pricing. Uh, and you have to break symmetry. So the model we have is one where you have the home that trades with two regions. U, that's the dominant currency region and R, which is the rest of the world. Um, 
by the small open economy assumption, we're going to have uh, prices and quantities are going to be exogenous in UNR. We have a utility function that has consumption and uh, labor supply in there. Uh, and then we're going to bring in, we bring in a, a strategic complementarities in pricing using a Kimball aggregator, which is a particular functional form for, uh, for demand. Uh, and that gives rise to strategic complementarities in pricing and variable markups in a, in a very, in a kind of a, in a way that can be handled more, more, more easily. Uh, in this world because you have all other kinds of problems here in terms of rigidities of all kinds. The trade, you tra these kind this country trades international risk-free bonds in, the, in again, new currency. Uh, and wages are sticky here, uh, a la Calvo. The second piece of that is uh, we have the production function. Uh, and the production function uses labor and uses intermediate inputs. But this intermediate input aggregator X is again going to be a, the same aggregator as what we have here. And the, and the firm is going to use inputs from all over the world. Okay. And then what, what we do is we just allow for different fractions of pricing and producer currency and local destination currency and the dominant currency. Uh, that's just to nest the different paradigms over there. Uh, and then we, have, we need to have something that sets the domestic interest rate. We're going to have a domestic interest rate that's being set by monetary policy. This is an inflation-sensitive domestic interest rate. Uh, and, ex and we have a relationship between the two bilateral exchange rates. So it's quite important to have an exchange rate, uh, you know, the fact that there is some independent movement between the, again, in the three-country world, the data we used here was Colombia. So let me think of Colombia, U.S., and Brazil. We want some independent variation between the Colombian uh, dollar exchange rate and the Colombian, Colum Colombian peso and the dollar exchange rate and the Colombian peso and the real exchange rate because otherwise, again, it would just collapse to a two-country setup. Okay, so, the, so with these ingredients in there, uh, we can ask, with these ingredients in there, we go and estimate it, and not surprisingly, that's a model that rejects the other paradigms and in favor of the DCP. The uh, Colombia uses, like, 90%, 95% of its exports and imports are invoiced in dollars. Its trade with the euro area is also in dollars. Its trade with uh, most Asian economies are also in dollars. So, the, so it's, it's truly a kind of a dollar-using uh, dollar economy. OK, so with this world, so we can first ask, and so I'm getting to the point of the positive and normative implications, uh, which for which you, it does help to have a model. So we could ask, how does monetary policy work in this world? for the small open economy, right? What are the implications? So let's consider the case where you have a monetary policy shock at home. So I'm doing the home, which is Colombia. We have a, an expansionary monetary policy shock, which is a 25 basis point cut in interest rates in, uh, in Colombia. This is going to cause the pe Colombian peso to depreciate relative to the dollar. Uh, and to the uh, Brazilian real. This is, sad. this is as we would expect. There's no surprises there. Uh, depending upon the pricing parity. So this is, OK, I should, I should just specify. There are three lines over here. The so a solid blue line is the dominant currency paradigm. The black dashed line is producer currency pricing, the Mandel Fleming paradigm. Uh, and the other line here is, is local currency pricing, the third paradigm. So what are then the implications for inflation in Colombia? In the case of the dollar currency paradigm and producer currency paradigm, you get this big expansion. You get this big inflationary hit. Why is that? Because in the dominant currency paradigm, the prices of goods that you're importing are prices in dollars, and the dollar price is sticky, so you get a big kick in inflation. That's the same thing for producer currency pricing coming from both the markets. Uh, with LCP, you get no effect on inflation. So you get, you get, so exchange rate depreciations are costly for emerging markets because of, uh, of, uh, because of either DCP or PCP. The terms of trade. So the typical prediction of a model of this kind would be expansionary monetary policy. Uh, it leads to a depreciation of the terms of trade, which is, uh, which is here, as opposed to an appreciation in the case of LCP. 
With the DCP, you, should, you get absolutely no movement. So multipulse expansions that associated with exchange rate depreciations have almost no impact on your terms of trade. What about on the export side, which then means that you get, while Mandel Fleming paradigm would say that you should get this big kick in exports because now your currency is weaker and you should be selling in international markets, you get almost no variation in, uh, in, in exports. So you get, almost, you get almost no variation in exports. Why is it? So I think of destination being the, uh, the US. I'm going to get the, if the, if the price at which I'm selling to the US market is prices are sticky in dollars. I'm not going to get any expansion from that. And if I look at prices being sold, sold in real, though it's in dollars, if the real is moving the same way as the dollar is moving relative to the peso, again, I'm going to get no kick in terms of my exports. On the other hand, I'm going to get a big reduction in imports because everything is just more costlier now for from, from my imported goods. So I'm going to get a big drop in imports, unlike the case, and much unlike the case of uh, local currency pricing, where you actually get an expansion in your imports because you've had a positive demand shock coming through this monetary expansion. Um, so if you combine the two together, so if I combine exports and imports together, and I look at trade, which is now, you could take as total trade, exports plus imports for Colombia, you get this interesting prediction that a monetary expansion in this world leads to a decline in trade for Colombia, as opposed to in both those other paradigms of PCP and LCP. So why is that? The reason is compared to the Mandel Fleming paradigm, when you have a depreciation of your exchange rate in the Mandel Fleming paradigm, you drop you, your, your imports go down because your imports have become more expensive, and that's all good. But it's offset by this big increase in your exports. You get an export kick. So though imports have gone down, your exports are going up, and the net effect obviously depends upon the relative weights of the two, and, you're going to, and you can end up with an expansion in, 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 in trade. And so this is the notion that you would say that, okay, commodity exporters, when commodity prices fall, their exchange rate depreciates, but that may not be all bad because they're able to sell more to the international markets. That comes from the Mundell Fleming paradigm. So you get overall trade goes down. But in contrast with DCP, you get that imports fall, but your exports also don't move much at all. So the combination of no movement in your exports with a drop in your imports shows up as an overall decline in trade. Right. So what, what happens here is you could think of the case, and we have many simulations in the model, but you could think of the case there when you have a stronger dollar in world markets, you could end up with a reduction in global trade. It could be associated with a reduction in global trade relative to these other paradigms. Because in the Mandel Fleming paradigm, a stronger dollar is a weaker dollar for a weaker currency for everybody else, and they're able to export more. But that doesn't happen here. And, why is, and here you can end up with, the, when everybody's currency is depreciating relative to the dollar, it's states of the world when the dollar is stronger relative to all countries, you can end up with trade coming down because of the fact that when I trade, even if I'm not trading with the US at all, if I'm trading with a third country, because of the fact that their currencies have depreciated relative to the dollar, and because the goods that you're selling to that country are priced in dollars, you're going to end up with a scaling back of both imports and therefore exports. All right. All right. So, Clearly, this particular prediction on what happens to world trade depends upon how all the currencies in the world co-move relative to the dollar. Uh, and these are details that you know, one has to stare at before figuring out what the actual prediction is going to be. Um, but again, what matters for a country's bilateral trade with another trading partner is not their bilateral exchange rate, but their currencies relative to the dollar. OK, so this is, again, things we're playing with. We're still clear cleaning up. But in the op under optimal monetary policy for the small open economy, in the benchmark of Galli and Monticelli, what you would want to do under some assumptions with some parameter restrictions, you could end up with a nice loss function that tells you what the monetary authorities would like to stabilize. You get the fact that they would like to st stabilize inflation and the output gap. All right? uh, and that comes from why is that? Why is inflation costly? Inflation is costly because when prices are sticky, you get some firms changing prices and some firms not. You get inefficient price dispersion. And because of inefficient price dispersion relative to the flex price benchmark, 
you end up with misallocation of resources, and that's the misallocation that shows up as being costly in terms of welfare, right? And that's why you have inflation being costly in these models. In the dollar currency pricing world, you also have the same thing, which is the fact that there are firms that are set setting prices. In the domestic market, all firms are selling in domestic currencies. That, that would be the standard assumption. Uh, so all firms in, in, in Colombia are setting prices when they sell at home in Colombian pesos. Uh, and they're changing prices at different points in time, which means because of the fact that they, because of the cost of changing prices, because of the sticky price assumption. And so you again have the same fact that if you're in an environment where firms have to change prices or you're in an inflationary environment, you're going to end up with inefficient price dispersion and you're going to get misallocation of resources that again has a negative impact in terms of welfare. But in addition to that, you have one other source of inefficiency that shows up in this world, which is the fact that Colombian firms are setting different prices for their product in domestic markets and the international market. Because they're selling at a domestic price that's sticky in pesos, and they're selling at an international, in the international markets is a price that's sticky in dollars. So when the exchange rate moves around, the, the law of one price fails. Uh, and this is a violation of what's optimal because the marginal cost of production is exactly the same for both those goods. So they should actually be charging the exact same price in both markets, but they're not. So you're getting inefficient price dispersion cross-border. All right? So, but, so you end up with a, another piece that shows up in the loss function, which is that it would be optimal also, even conditional inflation on the output gap, for a central banker in, uh, in Colombia to care about the movement of their exchange rate relative to the dollar. Because that would get rid of this inefficient uh, pricing in these different, in these different markets. All right. You could have got that prediction also from local currency pricing. But that prediction would say that, again, you cared about the trade-weighted exchange rate. What the dominant currency paradigm tells you is that you really care about your exchange rate relative to the dollar, which kind of seems like what policymakers in the world do, which is that when they care about the currencies, they not really care about the currencies relative to pretty much every, all of their trading partners. They do focus a lot on their currency relative to the dollar. OK, so I'm just going to conclude now. Um, the dominant currency paradigm is where you have pricing in the dominant currency. Pricing complementarity is imported input use and production. I think this is a, just a much more natural description of the world. Even if you had to, if you have to, our models have to pick an approximation. If you had to pick an approximation, this would be a much better one than the ones we play with. The data strongly reject PCP and LCP in favor of DCP. There's, there's a stable terms of trade. Dominant currency passed through into trade prices and volume is high. Exchange rate passed through non-dominant currencies is low. Uh, export expansions following depreciations are weak. Uh, the implications for that is that you can have a stronger dollar, uniformly stronger dollar, can negatively impact global trade. The monetary policy transmission, like I said, shows, like I showed you, differs in important ways from Mandel Fleming. We're working on a recent paper. As you know, there's a big discussion going on in the US about the border adjustment tax. Um, and what the implications will be for trade and for the US dollar and all of that. The implications, without giving you the details, I have a paper that I'm writing which, will, which highlights the differences. Uh, and in terms of optimal policy, monetary policy targets now a dollar exchange rate besides the uh, inflation and output gap. Thank you very much, Gita. Very stimulating talk. So we have time for some questions before lunch. Has anybody got a question? There's one here, and there's one at the back. And I have a question, so you start. We have roving mics, so please wait for the mic. And could you announce who you are? I'm John Fender from the University of Birmingham. A couple of points about exchange rate pass-through, which you didn't mention in your lecture, but I'm sure you've thought about. Uh, first is the temporary permanent distinction. I'd expect that would be quite important in um, exchange rate pass-through if I'm selling a good in another market and the exchange rate change, but I expect it to be temporary. I probably won't change that price very much, but if it's a permanent change, I will 
change it more. And secondly, a lot of the literature on exchange rate passed through uh, treats the exchange rate change as a purely ex exogenous change with nothing else happening, whereas in reality, exchange rate changes are usually due to something else happening. For example, you know, on the 24th of June, if I'm exporting to um, the rest of Europe, I may think, just looking at the exchange rate change, oh, how wonderful, every um, euro I earn will... Um, will uh, convert into far more um, pounds. But on the other hand, um, the reason why the exchange rate has changed is that it may be much more difficult for me to sell the good in Europe in the future, and surely that should affect my pricing decisions. So I just wonder whether you'd like to say something about those two, two issues. Great, thanks. Yeah, no, this is, uh, those, are, those are very important points. So uh, to the first point about so I should just say that when, when people run a pass-through regression, it's not as if anybody believes that the, that the exchange rate is an exogenous variable that's moving around. Uh, I, I think of it as a very reduced form characterization of the data, which says that here's a correlation between movements in the exchange rates and, and pass-through. Now the question is what you do with that in terms of then inferring in terms of policy and the implications of that. Uh, that's when you start having to get into something more, more structural. And so what we do in our, in our model, the model that we're using to simulate the data and play with, for, for Colombia it's actually quite easy because commodity prices drive a lot of the exchange rate movement. And so we know where that comes from. But yes, but I think one, one has to be very careful. To the question of transitory versus permanent, well, you know, if you, if you want to econometrically describe the exchange rate, uh, the random walk assumption seems to be a very good assumption of the behavior of the exchange rate. So while you might see, you know, what looked like transitory movement, but still it seems to be, uh, when, when people try to estimate the behavior of exchange rate, it seems to be coming from, 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 being, from, a, from a process that is a random walk process, which in that world would be that every time you see the exchange rate move, you, th you should think of this as being a permanent change. Now, in reality, if, if you look at exchange rate expectations, it doesn't look like people, in some surveys, believe that the exchange rate is a random walk. They do think that, some, that they think it could be transitory. Uh, but again, what you'd have to be, you, you would have to form your opinion about what is it you think is driving the exchange rate around and the expectations formations process for, for people to make, to make further statements. Um, but again, but I think that the basic facts about pass-through and about the relationship between exchange rates and, 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 uh, and prices and the fact that those, those point you away from the mundell Fleming paradigm, I'm very confident that those things are not sensitive to these particular uh, assumptions. Thanks very much. There was a question there. Yes. Can you take a mic up there, please? And then we'll need a mic down here after that. Thank you. I'd like to ask you a question about currency hedging. Um, so if I'm British Airways or Japanese exporter, I might be invoicing in dollars, but I'm hedging my currency exposure back into my local currency, my reporting currency, the currency in which I've got liabilities. Um, have you looked at whether some of this, um, the importance of the dollar rather than the bilateral exchange rate is related to the costs of hedging? So for a country like Colombia or Argentina, it's very expensive to hedge. For a country like the UK or Japan, it's cheaper. So, yes. So, so let me speak about hedging, because I think that's, a very, that's an important point, and it's one of the things that come to mind when people are thinking about invoicing choices, right? Which is the fact that uh, if I'm a Japanese firm and I'm selling, say, to the US, uh, I could do one of two things. Suppose you and I have agreed on, on a certain quantity of trade. Then I could do one of two things. I could set the price in yen, and then I know, the, uh, then I know that in six months I'm going to pay the certain yen amount. Or I'm a Japanese firm, and I, I, the, the other person says, no, we set the price in dollars, so we're going to pick a price that's in dollars. So I'm going to get a certain sale value. It's a quantity that we agreed on times the dollar price then I can hedge that using one of the forward contracts, and I can guarantee myself the exact same yen return. Right? So, that, so this is a world in which it doesn't really matter whether I, 
I, in, if I could perfectly hedge, it's a world where it doesn't matter whether I price in dollars or I price in yen. But that's not the world that, that uh, is, is the world in trade. The world that we have in, 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 we actually observe is the contracts specify very often a price, but they don't specify the exact quantity that I'm going to buy from you at that price. Right? So the Japanese firms selling to the US, when they set a dollar price, the quantity that I sell there, if I'm not going to change my dollar price, maybe that doesn't move around that much. But if I set a yen price, then the dollar price is going to move around, which is going to change my quantity. That's not something you can hedge. You can't hedge uh, unpredictable quantity movements in this, with, with more standard contracts. You could in very sophisticated ways, but that would be very hard to do, and most people would not do that. So the reason I'm making that point is to say that the invoicing choice decision, once you acknowledge the fact that quantities aren't fixed, like completely sticky, uh, is a relevant decision, even in a world where you could perfectly hedge. Okay? So, so, so that's one. Then the second thing is the point that you made, which is, I think, also a very important point, which is the relationship between invoicing choices and not just hedging, but I would think of things like trade finance. Right? The fact that the dollar gets used a lot in financial, uh, for, for borrowing purposes in the international market, as a funding currency for trade finance, it's much more cheaper, people say, to borrow in, 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 in dollars. But that then has an implication for invoicing. So I, don't have, I didn't have time to go into it, but I have a paper that doesn't exist on my website right now, but I'm working on, which is basically bringing together the fact that you have complementarities here. When you have a world where the dollar gets used a lot by the banking system, even outside of the US, and the fact that you have invoicing in international trade, that there has to, there's a link between those two which can then end up with, with why you end up with a very strong reason for the dollar being used both in trade and in, in financial markets. Good, thank you. Is there still a question here? You have to wait for the microphone. <coughs> thank you. So I wonder uh, if there is an, any connection between the dominant currency diagram and the local currency diagram. Because as in a global market, the, the do dollar is, of course, currently the dominant currency. But if there is any case that when the dollar loses its dominant position, such as in a Chinese dominant market, or would that influence anything? <laughs> Thank you. Um, so yeah, so in the hypo so in the case where uh, you have another currency that emerges, so what we know. If the dollar's role has been really very, very stable for a very, very long time now. Even with the euro having coming in, come in, you just don't see much in terms of uh, the euro's role in markets. So I know, you know China is obviously making a big push for uh, its invoicing in, in yuan. So it's, when it's entered trade deals, it's, it's con trying to convince people to use the yuan. But from what I've heard, so I think the yuan usage has not gone up to 5 or 7% for their trade. Uh, they don't say what the rest of the currency is, but I think it's, it's the dollar. Uh, what, the, what the Chinese have managed to accomplish is not the invoicing in the sense of that we write a contract that has a price that's sticky in yuan. What they managed to accomplish is a settlement currency, which is that when you actually pay me, you pay me in, in yuan and not in, and not in dollars. All right. So, but then to the question of what happens if you hypothetically move away. For me, I would think that more... Given that this is all about a nominal anchor in terms of nominal pricing, I would say that suppose for some reason the world said all agreed that we're going to use the SDR, the IMF's SDR as a unit of account, and we all set our prices in that. Now, obviously, the SDR doesn't have the world's basket of currencies, but it has you know, four or five of the big, uh, big currencies in there. Then you could end up with there being much more symmetry in the world. Uh, right now, we have a situation where pass-through into the US is lowest, in, in very low, but to everybody else, it's, it's, it's quite high. Um, and you could break that symmetry with, with a different unit of account. But that obviously would require, you know, firms have responded to the fact that you, because of the dollar situation, the decision about where to locate my factories, all of that is tied into this big, into this, into this whole thing. So it's not something that can happen just very quickly. But, uh, but yeah, but it would have, obviously, it would have very big implications. Yes. No? 
I guess a more contemporary version of the same question. Uh, so you make a very persuasive case that a country like Colombia will look totally like dollar pricing. But if I take Switzerland, which you are showing there's a third in dollars, a third in euro, a third in the Swiss franc, is that a convex combination of the three models? Uh, does that look anything different? Um, it, I mean, it's, okay. So firstly, I gave you the example of Colombia because of the data, but the, but the, the, when I gave you the facts on the paper that I have on global trade and the dollar, we are looking at 2,500 country pairs, right? So, so Switzerland, again, is, uh, is, I mean, the, those, those are more the exceptions than the rule, all right? Secondly, it's not as if Switzerland only trades with the US uh, and, your, and, you, and the euro area and the others. So we, we're, coming, we're, we're still coming back to, even for the people who have more than one currency that they use, they go at most to three. They, it is not the trading partners. It's not the trade-weighted bundle or anything of that kind, right? So, 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 you, so the question is, with those three, am I now approximating some convex combination of PCP or LCP or... I would say for the case of Switzerland, I mean, I would probably say, you know, either it would be the dominant currency as in euro with some PCP. That would be, uh, that would be my description. You think I'm looking at my Apple um, iPhone and it's very rude of me, but it's not because you can ask questions through the app on this. But I did want to ask you a question about apples and bananas. <laughs> And you see, when the pound collapsed after the Brexit referendum, the price of Apple computers went up by 20% pretty much immediately, but the price of bananas stayed pretty much the same in my supermarkets. And I wonder if this was something to do with the substitutability of Apple computers for other goods and the lack and the complete substitutability of Colombian bananas for Ecuadorian bananas and so forth. Does this feature at all in the thinking in this field? I'm kind of micro guy, so I'm bound allowed to ask this sort of question. Yeah, you, don't have to, you don't have to apologize for that. The, uh, the, uh, yes, the, absolutely. So the decision about currency invoicing like I said, one of the factors is the strategic complementarities in pricing. And it would be that if you have a product that is in a very competitive market where uh, you know, you're gonna have lots of substitutes for it, you would, you would have a different pricing decision to make than if you have, the, mm -hmm. you, know, you have a dominant market share in a particular, particular product and, no, and there are a few substitutes for it. The second thing is all of this stuff has to do with, Apple is a good example of a product to use for this analysis because Apple prices are being set by a firm that's pricing power, uh, while for bananas it's more of a competitive market and you have a world, a world prices for it. So, so, so for commodities, which is why all of the analysis have been very careful to talk about non-commodities. Mm -hmm. Excellent, very good. Um, Marcus, question there. Yeah. And then I think we're going to wrap up after this question. Uh, Peter will be around all day, so it'll be time to continue. Uh, Marcus Miller from <clears throat> Warwick University. Uh, thank you for telling us all about the dominant currency paradigm. I wonder if you could say how this relates to the work of Helen Ray of the London Business School, who is also challenging the um, Mandel-Fleming paradigm with what she calls the global financial cycle. She argues that you don't essentially get uh, monetary independence by having floating rates because of this global financial cycle. My impression is she's looking a lot at the financial uh, sector with cross-border banking and not so much at currency pricing. So I'd be very interested to hear what you'd like, have to say about her research. Yeah, Thank no, you. that's a great, that's a great uh, parallel, and I like that research very much. But it's exactly what you said, and these are compliments. Everything I'm doing is on the trade side. Everything she's talking about is on the, on the finance side. But obviously, there is these two things. There, there has to be a link between those two because the two worlds intersect. And so the work that I'm doing now is basically, uh, and interestingly, we don't have a framework to think about it. So actually, what I'm working on now is exactly that, that framework. Very good. Thank you very much. Indeed. OK, thank you.